Hello, everyone. This is World Review with Evo Dalder, a weekly look at news from around the world produced by the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. It's Friday, October 27th. This week, we again look at the crisis in the Middle East and its wider ramifications for the region and for the world. Israel so far has delayed a major ground invasion amidst reports of growing differences within Israel and growing doubts in Washington about the wisdom of the strategy Israel is pursuing. Meanwhile, the humanitarian situation in Gaza has become catastrophic, according to UN agencies. Only 74 trucks of uh, food and supplies have crossed the borders so far, and fuel, food, and water are running out for the 2.3 million people who are stuck in the enclave. Last night, the United States launched limited airstrikes in an effort to deter further escalation. Uh, but at the same time, we're seeing fears rising in Washington and around the region that this conflict may well spiral out of control. And then finally, in the rest of the world, everyone is looking at this conflict with increasing concern about the number of casualties, the reaction that it is evoking in the region and for many at home, and the rising economic impact that the crisis will have. Here to talk about these issues are three reporters who cover these stories. Karen DeYoung is associate editor and senior national security correspondent at the Washington Post. Giles Wattel is world affairs editor at Tortoise Media. And Bobby Gosh is opinion editor at Bloomberg Opinion. Welcome all, great to see you all here on, uh, on this Friday morning. Uh, Bobby, let's just start with you. Uh, the situation on the ground in the region is uh, precarious. I think that is a, uh, a, a euphemism. It is really uh, on a knife's edge with still thinking of further uh, escalation by the Israelis, the humanitarian situation inside Gaza becoming more and more difficult, and the region standing by and watching and wondering, is there anything they can do? to make sure that this conflict ends in a way that satisfies all of the parties. Um, sort of bring us up to date about what you're seeing uh, and, and what we should be focused on and, uh, and worry about. Well, any war is, uh, the, your perception of any war depends on what prism you're looking at it through. Uh, what, from, from one perspective, we are in a, in a sort of strange holding position for, for a couple of weeks now. We've been waiting for the Israeli ground offensive into Gaza. That hasn't happened. So you might, if you're looking at it from that perspective, you might think things are in sort of uh, in limbo at the moment. If you're living in Gaza, that's not what you're thinking because the war is being conducted by other means. The, the constant bombardment uh, of Gaza, um, the sort of uh, the choking of the population into smaller and smaller uh, parts of the strip where they can uh, sort of hope to be with, with some some degree of uh, security. On the other side, Hamas keeps firing rockets into Israel. And so, you know, Israel doesn't necessarily, if you're an Israeli, particularly um, if you're anywhere close to Gaza, you're, you're not feeling like the war is in, in any kind of sense of suspension. Um, the big questions that were being asked last week about creating a humanitarian corridor, you know, getting food, medicine, fuel, uh, water into Gaza have only partially been answered. I mean, there, there have been some convoys that that have been allowed through the, the southern the checkpoint in Rafa from Israel, from uh, Egypt. But those are very, very small amounts of material in a, in normal times, if anything about Gaza can be described as normal, more than 100, something like 120, 130 trucks carrying uh, basic supplies go into Gaza every day. These days, you're lucky if there are 10 or 15 of them uh, in the past few days. And so that's clearly not enough. Um, a big problem is the that while some uh, supplies have been allowed, fuel still remains a problem. And this is a problem especially uh, for the hospitals, which are overworked, as you can imagine, and need fuel to run their generators, and for the water salination plants, which, news, which need fuel to provide drinkable water. So the, the humanitarian crisis inside Gaza has not greatly um, 
diminished. If anything, it's getting progressively worse as more and more hospitals get hit um, and uh, other sort of vital um, installations. Off the center stage in Doha, in Qatar, there have been negotiations uh, constantly about those hostages, more than 200 of them. Um, a few have been released, but very few. Um, th there are always reports of sort of that Qatar is about to engineer a breakthrough. Um, I am skeptical. I think we'll see drips and drabs, more and more hostages being released, which is which is which is always good. But I can't imagine Hamas letting everybody go. That's the only real card they have to play at this point. Um, so I think the particularly the sort of Israeli male hostages um, will probably remain uh, hostages for a while yet. So this is the backdrop. The United States is very concerned about uh, the what kind of offensive the Israelis are planning. Um, they're constantly advising against going in too hard, too heavy. They're they're advising the they're sort of suggesting the cautionary tales of Fallujah, of Mosul, of other such uh, urban conflict situations. They're also asking the Israelis to show some sense of what they want to do afterward. And and there's a lot of anxiety in in the White House and the State Department that the Israelis don't seem to have a plan for the day after. They're, even now, two weeks, nearly three, after the, the first uh, terrorist attacks, there does not seem to be a plan. The Israelis keep saying we're going to eliminate Hamas, which seems a, a kind of odd and unrealistic uh, goal, uh, but no suggestion as to what will come after the, the, the main violence has been, has been taken care of, over and done with. Um, we could go on. I could go on, but I think that's more than enough for us to start chewing on. Bobby, I think that it sets the the, the scene, uh, which is why I think all of us are so depressed uh, uh, while looking at this uh, at this conflict. Karen, we'll, we'll we'll get back to a minute to the sort of the debate in Washington and the Washington piece of it. But you were writing uh, this week, uh, and and of course, take pick up anything that Bobby said. But you wrote this week about how the UN uh, is, is looking at. Uh, uh, the conflict and it, it, it's this growing concern you have, particularly among UN agencies, that the situation uh, inside Gaza, uh, because of the lack of fuel and, and increasing the lack of food and and, and clean water, uh, is really, as they described it, catastrophic, uh, which is not a word used easily. Uh, um, what you've talked to folks around the ground there, uh, and 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 what are they trying to do, and, and what do they see as the main obstacle for bringing in this uh, this much needed relief to the people who live there? Well, you know the the United Nations, uh, the whole Israeli problem. People keep saying you have to look at it, Israeli Gaza problem. You have to look at it in context, and obviously the UN has been dealing for decades, or trying to deal for decades with the situation uh, between Israel, sorry, my phone fell down, Israel and the Palestinians. Um, and I think that all of that has sort of come to come to a climax at this point. Um, you've had for years the United States vetoing resolutions to do various things uh, for the Palestinians to criticize various things about Israel. Uh, I think that in the wake of the October 7th attacks, horrific um, worldwide sympathy, condemnation of Hamas. And But what you saw gradually over the last two weeks, 10 days, is sympathy begin to switch, much to the consternation of Israel and, and, and the United States. And it has begun to focus on what's happening with the Palestinians. The, the United Nations, which is the biggest aid provider and coordinator in Gaza uh, has had a daily drumbeat from the Secretary General on down of the worsening situation, how many people are dead. I think there are now 59 UN workers, uh, all Palestinians uh, in Gaza that have been killed and untold members of, of their families among the what the, what the Gazans say are 7,000. Uh, and that's a figure that, that although President Biden has said, why should we believe figures coming out of Gaza? The United Nations as a body has stood up very strongly and said, this is the figure. We've been working with these people for years. 
we have no reason to to uh, doubt their figures. And they have described how with no fuel, uh, you can't have any electricity. There hasn't been any electricity there other than by generators, which need fuel for years. Without electricity, you have no water. You have no hospitals operating. Uh, hospitals are being bombed. And so there's been this real drumbeat and the administration, both because of the humanitarian situation inside Gaza and because it still hasn't managed to get more than 400 uh, U.S. citizens and their families who want to leave Gaza out of there, uh, is finding itself pushed into a corner and really starting to put more and more pressure, gingerly, but pressure on Israel uh, to do something about this. I mean, you had, starting with President Biden's trip there last week and going through Secretary Blinken there for days, Secretary Austin there to talk to the military people about what, what they're doing. Um, last week, you had a, a Security Council resolution by Brazil, uh, which called for uh, humanitarian pauses. Um, the United States vetoed it. Over the weekend, you had Secretary Blinken saying, well, we think humanitarian pauses should be considered. And then this week in the in the Security Council, you had a U.S. resolution actually calling for humanitarian pauses. What does what does a humanitarian pause mean? It means that the Israelis have to stop airstrikes around the border area um, and to allow people to leave. Uh, the administration has at various times said, "Oh no, it's Hamas that won't let them leave." Uh, virtually everyone else says, no, Hamas is not at the border. They're not the ones not letting them leave. It's the airstrikes and it's people uh, on the Egyptian side not letting them in because they fear that in addition to foreign citizens, there will be a rush of hundreds of thousands of Gazans and they don't want another refugee crisis there. So all of this is still up in the air. David Satterfield, the, uh, the Biden's coordinator for humanitarian aid, in Gaza is is has been in Israel this week trying to persuade them. And the United States is finding itself increasingly in the minority, uh, at, certainly at the United Nations. Um, the EU has called for humanitarian pauses. Um, it's, it's, um, there were contesting resolutions this week again with the United States calling for humanitarian pauses. Russia and China vetoed it because it didn't call for a ceasefire. Russia had a competing resolution that did call for a ceasefire, and the United States and Britain vetoed it. But the interesting thing was you saw virtually everyone else on the council, including a lot of a lot of U.S. partners and allies that would, did not want to be in the position of, um, of voting for a Russian resolution, actually abstained um, from it. So it's it's put the United States in a very bad position. The General Assembly is meeting today and will vote on an Arab resolution calling for a ceasefire. Uh, a lot of U.S. friends, I think, will vote for that resolution. Uh, Israel isolated the Palestinians in Gaza, not uh, uh, really becoming the, the, the object rather than the subject uh, of the machinations that are happening internationally and in the region. And in the meantime, Giles, we are also seeing um, uh, a widening of this conflict with uh, uh, shooting and, uh, uh, of course, from Hezbollah in the north uh, and the Israelis back uh, in Syria, uh, U.S. forces being attacked in there and in Iraq, and this extraordinary uh, missile strike uh, by the Houthis uh, that was intercepted by uh, the U.S. Uh, a U.S. ship in the in the Red Sea. Uh, there is this, the region seems to be watching this and just getting hotter and hotter and hotter and more and difficult to control. Uh, how, how do you uh, read that and, of course, uh, see where we are today? Well, precarious is the word you used, and, and that was underlined just before we started this conversation or a few hours ago. Uh, another possible instance of... Um, uh, missiles being fired from from Yemen. At any rate, um, uh, Israel countering what they called an aerial threat over over the Red Sea. It just shows how, at any point, this can spill outside the borders of 
Israel and Gaza, but um, it's precarious in so many other respects too, isn't it? I'm I'm really struck by the overused um, metaphor of the tightrope. All the key players, both close in and further out, are walking their own tightropes. Just as an example, Netanyahu himself has to be seen to be tough on Hamas at some point uh, for the sake of his own survival in office. And yet the pressure to get hostages back first is nowhere uh, uh, stronger than from within Israel. Uh, Sisi, across the border in, in Egypt, um, has to be seen, excuse me, I have a dog barking downstairs, but I do have a son who's supposed to be controlling him. Um, <laughs> DC has to be seen to be supporting the Palestinians, otherwise the Egyptian street is in danger of uh, erupting in opposition to his rule, which is already oppressive enough. But at the same time, he's quite happy, uh, quietly, to see Israel preparing to destroy Hamas, which let's not forget is an offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood, which which he deposed and then destroyed um, uh, a decade ago. Um, Mohammed bin Salman in in in, in Riyadh uh, again he needs to be seen to be supporting the, the Palestinians, but his one of his great projects before October seventh was normalizing relations with Israel. So you have this almost circus like image of regional leaders walking their tight ropes. And, uh, uh, and and that is the context, isn't it, for this delay, waiting to see what will give bef be before this uh, ground invasion, which we presume is still going to happen. But I have a question. Uh, I was reading this morning of 360,000 Israeli reservists actually being sent home for the moment. So when is this going to happen? I, could could the, the hold that we're seeing last weeks more? I haven't seen the report on. Uh, yeah, I haven't seen that, but that would be very, very curious because calling them up is an enormous logistical exercise. It's part of the reason for the delay in the ground offensive was that it is a huge logistical exercise, especially if if the objective is not simply to go in and come out, but go in and stay for a while and and follow through on this threat to eliminate Hamas, whatever that means. Um, that's a huge logistical exercise, and Israel has spent three good part of three weeks and burned through who knows how many tens of millions of dollars in getting that done. To send them home is another big logistical exercise, especially if you're going to have to call them up again. Mm. Uh, so it, it seems odd. And and remember when... Was when the Economist reporting that this morning? Who is? The Economist. Oh, that's very interesting. Because then, then when you call people back, you, you're sending them back, I suspect, in part because the economy is basically... In the, the, there's so many Israeli companies that uh, are are kind of in this sort of frozen mode because uh, so many of their employers have employees have been called up, and I suppose you could give them some, you know, uh, f relief by sending their their employees back. But then it's very odd if you have to call them up again in another week or two. It seems very strange. I think I think two things about that. One is that. Um, as, as we saw with Ukraine, uh, when the Russians mobilized on the border prior to the initial invasion there, you can't keep troops sitting in readiness, mm -hmm. sitting in tanks, sitting in uh, forever. And they've been there now for more than two weeks. Yeah. Um, and also that, uh, again, this is the thing that the Americans, I think, are pushing pretty hard with the Israelis, um, saying with, with the, the U.S. Defense Secretary, the head of the central command, everybody, their message is urban warfare, not a good idea. Um, we don't know what your plan is for that. How are you the reminding of what happened in Mosul, uh, what happened in, in other places where thousands and thousands were killed, uh, where the Israelis can expect to lose a lot of people um, in addition to however many Gazas, Gazans are, are killed. So it's a I think it's a complicated, complicated situation. Uh, Karen, Karen, just uh, uh, let, let's let's continue on, on on sort of this debate in the United States because it's remarkable when you think about what the initial uh, uh, public uh, uh, utterances and I think private as well after October seven, where uh, strong, unquestioning support backing Israel. Uh, not that that rhetoric has changed. But you've seen over the last three, almost three weeks now, 
a, a market shift, uh, both in terms of a focus on Palestinians and, and what's happening in Gaza. As you mentioned, this real worry about uh, uh, how to, a ground offensive would actually uh, uh, happen and then what, what might come afterwards. And is in growing worry that uh, I was in Washington this week that I felt uh, walking around in, in the old executive office building of escalation, uh, uh, that this thing mm -hmm. is, is no longer in their control. I think they were shocked by the Yemeni missiles. Uh, they, that was, that yes. came pretty darn quick. And all of a sudden, they're looking at a massive evacuation, potentially, of Americans. It's, it's a very different mood. And I wonder whether uh, that mood, I mean, it help us to describe it. You're there and you talk to them uh, every single day. And also what impact that's having on the discussion that is that the U.S. is having with the Israelis. Um, I, I think to go back to, to Giles's metaphor, they're walking on a tightrope and underneath it on all kinds of sides are Congress, which is still very, very supportive of Israel and wants the United States essentially to encourage Israel to go farther, uh, to strike back very hard at, at Iran. Um, you, on the other hand, you've got people in the streets at universities and demonstrations in Lafayette Square across from, from the White House, uh, marching in the streets of New York and other large cities, pro-Palestinians saying, you know, you're letting these people suffer. This is your fault. You've got uh, the upcoming vote on aid for Ukraine and Israel, which the administration stuffed in one package. You've got the new Speaker of the House saying, nope, we're not going to do that. Uh, we want a separate Israel package. Um, there's, as you mentioned, huge concern about, about uh, escalating violence. The Iranian foreign minister was at the United Nations yesterday, gave a speech very specific saying, I, we want to warn you, United States, this is going to spread. You know, this is going to, we are not going to abandon our allies. Um, you know, and you can take that for rhetoric, but there definitely wasn't any pulling back on Iran's part. And if you go back to to uh, the whole question of, of normalization, as the administration calls it, normalization between Arab countries, uh, especially Saudi Arabia and Israel, which has been a real primary foreign policy objective for um, for President Biden. In the last, before this round, the last big attack by Iranian proxies on U.S. troops in Syria, especially, or in or in Iraq, was in March, and that was the point at which they launched these sort of backdoor conversations with the Iranians trying to come to some agreement on that and on uh, uranium enrichment by Iran. And they were quite pleased that they thought they got the Iranians to agree to stop these attacks. And in fact, they did stop until two weeks ago. And now they're pretty much every day. And so I think that, that their hopes for how they thought the Middle East was going to evolve obviously are, are just shattered. Yeah, I mean, I hear the same uh, the same uh, thing. I, I, I think the people are looking at Iran. They don't think Iran is sort of uh, fueling the fire, but they're not it's not doing anything to stop it. Uh, right. And they, they feel that the Iranians don't have the control over their own militias. And it, I think just as the foreign minister said, we're not going to be able to tell them no. Uh, yeah. We're just not in a in a position to do that, and the 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 awkward thing is, it's not clear that the U.S. is in the position to tell the Israelis no, uh, Giles. Exactly. Because, um, you know, you 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 have this posture post October seventh in particular, and if the Israelis want to go, now you don't hear them saying no. They're just here are the fifteen things we'd like you to think about before you sit before you go. Uh, how effective do you think? Is that is it seen uh, in Israel as uh, pressuring or maybe allowing giving leverage to a Netanyahu who is by all accounts not particularly enamored with going into uh, Israel full skill as the IDF is? Um, how, how should we look at this? It, it does seem that uh, pressure from Blinken and Biden uh, 
to t- to stop and think, consider the risks of urban warfare, as both Bobby and Karen were saying, it, it is having an effect. Let's uh, uh, in in staying um, Netanyahu's hand, and, and and let's remember the generals who've been brought in to try and create a an image of of unity and help him make those decisions. None of them being made at the moment. Let's also remember the effect of the hostages' families within Israel on in, insisting on a pause. Um, I think a really interesting internal aspect of this, and I'm going outside my comfort zone here because I don't know Israel well to, at, at first hand, but is that the fact that so many of the hostages' families are from kibbutzim in the south, where they tend to be of a secular left-wing variety who have absolutely no love for the administration, uh, of 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 Netanyahu and feel um, let down, obviously, by the legendary Israeli defense forces, but also principally by by Netanyahu's strategy and and his government. So uh, all these things are, I think, um, uh, having an effect uh, uh, and and are factors uh, in this delay. But I just wanted to come back to the point that Karen was making about the l- larger American goals in this. Uh, um, If we go back to October the 6th, um, the process of normalization of Israeli-Saudi relations, the the great goal was becoming, and I'm paraphrasing Mohammed bin Salman on this, closer every day. And if you see that um, uh, from the American perspective as partly a strategy for uh, pivoting away from the Middle East, which has caused uh, the US so much uh, angst and blood and treasure over the past three decades, in order to pivot to the Far East, then how long is it before the Republicans weaponize this against the Biden administration and say, hmm, how's that working out for you? You know, how how was that big stra- strategy working out for you now with two carrier groups in the region and uh, the possibility at any moment of being drawn into a, a fighting war. Uh, yeah, there's no doubt that politics uh, uh, rears its head at any moment in the United States. So uh, particularly as we, we enter a presidential election season, uh, for sure. Uh, and, you know, the larger politics is that Trump is running around saying it was quiet when I was there. Uh, not so quiet right now. Um, and, you know, uh Anyway, uh, that's a that's a that, that it's an issue and it's a it's a big one. Uh, Bobby, uh, um, pick up any of the points that the Giles and 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 Karen uh, uh, have in uh, have brought forward, and 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 also just just a, sort of your sense of where do you think the escalatory dynamic uh, in the region sort of is now, and 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 how to how do you prevent it from from spiraling out of control? So one of the things I've been paying attention to is Israeli public opinion, um, because you know it's a it's a fairly open society. There's plenty of polling that takes place all the time. We have, we can get a pretty good bead on public opinion uh, in Israel, and it's quite striking how that has moved over the last couple of weeks. Um, and and I, I don't know what. I can't really speak to what the contributory factors are, whether whether the the sort of advice from the United States is having some effect on public opinion, um, where, in addition to the effect on, on Netanyahu and his government. But Haaretz today, um, as we speak, just reported that a poll showing 49%, so nearly, 50, nearly half of all Israelis, saying that they are in favor of holding off on the ground invasion. Now that, if you had told me that one week ago from today, I would have laughed you out of the room. I would have said that's not possible. So that's quite interesting, isn't it? That that the the mood, I I, I think people are still mourning. Of course, the the trauma of October, the events of October seventh are far from uh, exercised. There's still a lot of anger. There's still a lot of there's still a desire to. Uh, as the as Netanyahu's government keeps saying to eliminate Hamas, but I think there's also a recognition that just blundering into um, into Gaza with heavy uh, armor is not necessarily the way to achieve those goals, um, and that's quite interesting. That so until a few days ago, my impression was that 
while Netanyahu was under pressure from abroad to hold off, he was also under pressure from within Israel to go ahead with the ground offensive. I think that might be changing. Um, and if that if that's the case, this is only one poll. We should we should hold off until there's more clarity. But if that is indeed the case, then that has the potential to change Netanyahu's calculus. It might be easier for him to sell the notion of holding off if that's already sort of taken root within uh, within. I mean, Bibi Netanyahu, as you know, Evo is nothing if not opportunistic. Um, so that's something I'm watching very closely, and and I'll I'll keep my eye on that because it's it's it does not get enough attention. I feel here, um, the, the, the you know, there's a lot of discussion about what Bibi's thinking or what he might be thinking, uh, not enough about how ordinary Israelis uh, are thinking. And I think what's what's fascinating, Karen, is that you you do get a sense that the administration is trying to delay. You know, finding new reasons to uh, to delay the offensive, maybe in fact to help the political climate in Israel to change uh, in the way that Bobby is is outlining and maybe changing, um, uh, and 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 hope that somehow the way to solve this this tightrope on this particular issue and the escalation issue because they think they they do see the two as as very much related uh, by finding a way to uh, um, uh, you know basically not only delaying, but actually not having the ground offensive until there is a real strategy that is much more likely to be success. Is the, you get that sense that that's part of their calculation? I, th I think changing the Israeli government has been part of their calculation for a long time. Um, the idea that if you had some kind of normalization with the Arab countries, the price that Israel would have to pay for that would be to change its policies toward the West Bank and annexation. And the only way to do that would be to change the composition of Netanyahu's coalition government. Um, you know, whether that has become, you know, whether they've incorporated that calculus into their current thinking about, about Gaza, I don't know. But I also think, you know, the, in terms of the Israeli thinking, um, their goal, as they've said it over and over and over again, is we have to destroy Hamas. Because if we don't destroy them, this will happen again. Um, the question is, is that even possible? Um, and if if so, is it does it necessitate a ground uh, assault? You know, it's interesting that they've done these mini assaults. They've had tanks going across the border the past couple of days for sort of targeted attacks. Um, they've also started dropping these big barrel bombs uh, that are designed to burst tunnels underground. Um, they also have the side effect of destroying a lot more civilians. Um, so I, th I think that the decision's not made yet in, in Israel. And, and the administration is, you know, still holding on to its hopes that at the end of the day here, you you will have a change in the composition of the government in Israel, and you will, over the very long term, and this is very much wishful thinking on their part, that this will actually contribute now to a two-state solution that, that long administ U.S. administrations have long sought, that people will finally say, gosh, this is the only way to deal with this. Uh, yeah, no, I think that's uh, that, that's clearly sure the case that uh, that they're they're hoping that I think you put it in exactly in in this light or larger context. I I also noticed the administration doesn't talk about destroying Hamas. They're talking about having a different governing structure, uh, yeah. and I think a slightly more realistic goal, by the way, uh, uh, to have that that you can't have the same political structure uh, uh, tomorrow as you had on October six. That doesn't necessarily mean. Uh, uh, destroying Hamas. Uh, uh, Giles, I want to have you get uh, in, into this conversation. Also, uh, uh, Karen, I think very appropriately has now raised that the administration and the, pri the president himself has raised the two-state solution. He did so in a speech, but again, very strongly yesterday, uh, I think it was yesterday, uh, the day before, uh, in his uh, press conference with, uh, uh, with the Australian prime minister, uh, where he said this becomes the only way you can solve this problem. Uh, now, Americans have long believed that, but it's not something that 
uh, top administration officials have been saying for a while because nobody thought it was going to get anywhere closer. And my sense is, and sort of broadening it out also, um, uh, is is there is a growing European and and presumably wider appreciation that that is in fact the way you're going to have to address this problem and that you can no longer put this on the back burner. It is front and center uh, in the Middle East once again. Yeah. And if you had said that uh, on October the 6th, um, you would have been reminded that the two-state solution was in everybody's rearview mirror receding fast. But my colleague, James Harding, said the day after those attacks, what is the smart move here? And he may have said this on your show, forgive me. Um, uh, the, the, the smart move is, is to go in hard, but at the same time, this is from the Israeli point of view, be, t be talking about reviving in earnest the two-state solution. Um, from the Palestinian point of view, you look at the maps. A lot of people have published really good series of maps over time and the shrinking territory controlled by the Palestinians since 67. And while ob obviously uh, uh, hardline Israeli concerns about being frankly outpopulated very quickly uh, in uh, uh, a, a two-state situation or uh, living side by side in, in greater peace are on one side. On, on the other, um, it, uh, if, if current trends are allowed to persist, there'll simply be no territory left uh, in, in, which to, in, in which to create the, second, the Palestinian state. Um, whether or not uh, that is the strategy that the Israelis choose to pursue uh remains to be seen it, it, it's it's high risk and you have to dust off a lot of documents that have been gathering dust for a long time just on the uh escalatory point that you raised earlier and we can get to uh, uh europe and and ukraine possibly in in a second um it it seems to me that there's a very simple mechanism by which escalation happens and uh, and and it's very close to israel in the event of a ground invasion, uh, the Hezbollah attacks from the north. And I, I think it's important not to forget the simple military calculus that must be going on uh, in Israel, uh, especially um, on the part of the generals who have been brought into the government. They would then be facing a practically unwinnable war underground in, in Gaza. And at the same time, uh, a war on a second front with Hezbollah, which let's remember is much bigger and better armed than Hamas. And um, from October the 7th, the risk to Israel was considered by most Israelis existential. It suddenly felt like a country with no, no properly defended borders. In those circumstances, even if there were no other considerations, um, uh, cancelling delay, you would, especially if in uniform, surely say, Let's let's get our ducks in a row. Yeah, interestingly enough, of course, the, uh, the part of the folks in uniform and others were were saying, "Well, now we need to go after Hezbollah preemptively uh, uh, earlier on." But I think that that calculus, just as you put it, Giles, is, has uh, has started to uh, to change as the people really understood what is what it means to go after Hezbollah in a preemptive mm -hmm. strike. Uh, and but it, it, but I, I also. I think it, it highlights, and, and Bobby, jump in here on, on because you know the region so well, but it, it sort of highlights that really for the first time in a long time, the Israelis are feeling that uh, their security is in question. Uh, uh, and, and, and it's not clear that they have the forces to protect them. Or even that they can trust the, the, the much vaunted intelligence systems that they've had in place for a very long time. I mean, they, if, I, if I were an Israeli general now, I'd be second guessing any intelligence that was put in front of me because I'd wonder how, how reliable it was after the sort of calamitous failure uh, of intelligence uh, leading up to October 7th. I, I think the point that Giles made uh, of sort of, you know, um, quoting Andrew Harding, I think it was um, that, you know, what Israel needs to do now is go in hard, but also have a plan. The trouble is that, yeah, that, that's the most obvious way. Benjamin Netanyahu can't be the person to do that. Because he has a, he has that's not that's not what he wants to do. He, his instincts are, are, are just going hard. And he has zero credibility. If Benjamin Netanyahu is the one who's holding up a plan, that plan is already dead in the water. 
Nobody's going to believe it for a second. Nobody's going to believe that he has any credibility. So the political structure has to change on both sides uh, for there to be any uh, progress. The political structure that existed on the 6th of October in Jerusalem uh, has to go uh, for that to be a workable uh, path forward. Um, and, and there's, again, lots of polling to suggest that Israelis want that political structure to change, that once this is all over, uh, that's that Benjamin Netanyahu's political career is done. Now, this is not the first time in 30 years I've said that. Um, but, you know, this is a pretty egregious failure of from Mr. Security. Um, so one, one assumes he's not going to come back from this. Uh, so that's the other part of the 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 problem that the White House, as well as uh, anybody else, is trying to solve, which is you're you're trying to get Netanyahu to restrain himself, but you're also kind of hoping that Netanyahu is not the person in charge for very much longer. You're you're I suppose part of the calculation will be that if 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 there is a long enough pause, then the Israelis will have occasion to think more deeply about who's leading them and um, and engineer, you know, the change of government uh, there to create a a, a, a new government, uh, a new prime minister who can then, who has the credibility to say, we are going to go in hard, but here's the peace plan for what happens afterward and have that be trusted by anybody else. Unfortunately, Yitzhak Marabin is no longer with us, uh, who had the credibility to do that uh, in some ways. Um, uh, uh, Let's let's uh, you know the uh, important points. I I, I don't uh, disagree with with any uh, thing um, there, but it's hard to to engineer changes in government in the middle of a major major uh, military confrontation. Uh, uh, which which whatever, even if without a ground invasion, you're still in a major major uh, military confrontation, given the kind of bombing uh, and defensive steps that uh, that uh, are are. Are taking place, uh, Giles. We have a couple more minutes, so uh, uh, perhaps too long. Pick up whichever you want. There is the European Union that has been meeting on this and seems to be deeply, deeply, deeply divided uh, right. on, uh, on the question. And there is also this incredible, increasing worry that American attention and the world's crisis uh, is pulling away uh, 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 the attention that the U.S. has had uh, focused on. Um, uh, on Ukraine, uh, right. both are both are big worries. Yeah, if you are Zelensky right now, you're dead worried um, uh, on on two fronts. I mean, very briefly, logistically, obviously, his primary concern on October the seventh was how is this going to draw away munitions that were headed for us? And uh, the U.S. position was we can handle both. We can walk and chew gum at the same time. But since then tens of thousands of 155 millimeter artillery shells that were um, being shipped to Ukraine have been redirected to Israel, or as it turns out, technically back to Israel because they've been stored in an Israeli um, uh, ammunition dump. Um, and uh, uh, Zelensky has since made it clear that he's also in dire need of air defense munitions, these anti-missile missiles for the winter. Uh, which served Ukraine very well last winter. He needs at least as many now uh, for, the, for the coming winter. That, um, but Admiral Rob Bauer uh, has said that the bottom of the barrel is visible and US munitions manufacturers, it's not just US, in Norway as well, are not yet tooling up quick enough. And in the meantime, Russia has a full-on war economy. Whatever else is, is, is not working, they are rearming. So it's deeply distressing uh, for Zelensky from a logistical point of view, but also um, diplomatic. The spotlight, understandably, has moved away. The media spotlight, the diplomatic spotlight, um, e efforts to bring the global south on side in the Ukrainian conflict had completely stalled uh, amid accusations of hypocrisy and double standards, which I vehemently disagree with. This, this is missing the whole point about the difference between these two. The invasion that has happened, which was unprovoked, that defines it, and the invasion which hasn't happened yet, which say what else you like about it, it was provoked. Um, so uh, this is a anxious time for for uh, Kiev. Uh, you mentioned is um, European disunity uh, on on Israel. That is very striking, especially in comparison with its unity so far on Ukraine. 
Yeah. Uh, uh, Karen, last word to you, because you mentioned that uh, the new Speaker of the of the House uh, uh, mm -hmm. has, uh, has said he wants to separate uh, the package uh, that, that the President uh, has asked Congress to pass, uh, uh, part Ukraine, part Israel, actually part some other stuff, uh, a package, by the way, that was first proposed, if I believe, by, by Mitch McConnell. Uh, right. As uh, uh, in in the Wall Street Journal about a week or two ago, uh, what's the what what's the thinking right now on on where uh, now that we finally the House has a speaker, uh, where this is going to go? Well, I think he he and the Republican conference have the power to do this. They have the power. They decide what goes to the floor and gets gets debated. And he said last night, "This is Speaker Johnson." I have to remind myself of his name. Um, said, this is what we're going to have an Israeli um, uh, bill first. We're going to separate these things out. I'm not against Ukraine, although he has voted against aid for Ukraine in the past. He said last night he's not against it. He thinks we have to support Ukraine, but that uh, Israel is much ur more urgent and it needs to be separated out. And that's what we're going to do first. Well, we'll be watching it uh, closely to see how that evolves as we will watch what is happening in uh, in Gaza, in Israel, and around the region and around the world uh, uh, in next week. Uh, and we'll have another discussion uh, here at World Review about those issues. In the meantime, uh, I want to thank uh, Bobby Gosh of Bloomberg, uh, Giles Wattel of Tortoise Media, and Karen DeYoung of The Washington Post for an insightful uh, uh, deep, uh, penetrating uh, discussion about the issues that are so preoccupying so many of us. And I think we want to wish everyone uh, safety uh, and as best as possible, a, uh, a good weekend. With that, till next week.